Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Kirsten Komorowski, Executive Director of the Walt Disney Family Museum. Kirsten has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kirsten, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So Walt Disney is, is such an interesting personality. He created an art form along with several others, but then he also created an institution that advanced that art form in many, many different ways. And then he diversified his activities beyond the art form for which he is known. Talk about the founding of this museum, highlighting this man's life's work. So the museum was founded by his oldest daughter, Diane Disney Miller. And there were a couple of motivations uh, for creating the museum. One was that there were people who didn't understand that Disney was a man. They identify with the brand, but they didn't understand that there was a man behind the brand. The other thing is that there were a number of biographies written about Walt Disney with some untruth. And Diane wanted to address that by telling the story of his life. And one of our big assets at the museum is Walt's own voice. There's a lot of uh, audio tape of him. So her idea was to have him tell his own story. So you can walk through the museum and listen to Walt uh, talk about his experiences and uh, the creation of all of these amazing things, his legacy. And people would ask Diane why she didn't write a book about her father. And she would say, this museum is my book. And what people don't really appreciate about Disney is that he is an artist, he's a performer, and in many respects, the persona of Walt Disney that, that was experienced by, by the public was also a persona. It was also part and parcel of that brand, but it was reflective of, of the man himself. So his voice is really so important to the telling of the story because it is such a personal story of, of, of ups and downs. That's right. And that's a good point. There were a lot of downs. There were a lot of challenges. And the mission of the museum is to tell his story, but also to inspire people, in particular, to persevere through challenges. His first company went bankrupt, uh, but he faced numerous challenges all along the way. and wasn't really financially secure until his 50s, after Disneyland opened. And, and even the opening of Disneyland was really at the cusp. It was real. I mean, it could have gone at that point either way. And it took a little bit before there was sufficient financial force behind his company to give him the security to experiment still further. That's right. And he had to leverage himself to the hilt in order to get Disneyland open. And he was only able to buy 160 acres in Anaheim. And he was also always disappointed by that, um, so much so that when he went to buy up land in Florida, he bought 27,000 acres. But he was always pushing, and there were a lot of naysayers, people who just didn't believe that a feature-length animation film, Snow White, would work, that people would come to a theme park in An Anaheim. So he was always fighting a tide because he was so innovative. The thing that, that I think that distinguishes a man like Disney, an artist, is that it really is about the art and the artistry. It is, it is not true that somebody who has built a company on that basis uh, feels that success is defined financially. Success is defined by a combination of different factors. Certainly you want to be able to continue to self-fund, but it is defined in so many other rich ways. Talk about how Disney defines success. It's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because uh, Snow White was a financial success, his first full-length animation, feature animation film. The next three, Bambi, Pinocchio, and Fantasia, which we all assume were hits, were financial failures and put the company at great risk. But it's because of that, precisely because of what you've identified, that he would not compromise. And he had a vision, and it cost a lot of money, and his partner and brother Roy uh, was tearing his hair out half the time because they were really getting into a bad financial situation. But Walt would not compromise. And particularly in the beginning films, there was not a repetition. If you take a look at those three films that you mentioned, Snow White, Bambi, and Pinocchio, they have stylistically different components. The, the story arcs are, are very different. 
Uh, the art is very different, and the techniques evolve considerably from one to the other. Um, it, it, it's so interesting how this man is going for a vision of, of the art and establishing that vision of the art while he's also struggling to keep his business afloat. Yeah, and he was always pushy. He was so innovative. So you're right, every film had a different component. He created the multiplane camera. We have one in the museum, this enormous object that to create depth in, right. in the films. But the, um, the iconic sequence in Pinocchio where they zoom into the village, that's a 45 second piece of the film that cost $45,000 at the time, which translates into something like $2 million in today's money, which is you know, another reason that his brother was really having a difficult time with Walt's decisions. But thank goodness that, that he has left us with these, these unbelievable films. It's amazing. And, and the other thing that I think is very interesting is the relationship between compromise and being willing to not compromise. In these film, films, you have a collaboration of a team that need to rub together and be informed by each other's sensibility. So there is an absolute need to compromise among these artists who each have their capabilities, visions, and ideas. Talk about how your perception of his attributes uh, affects the museum and how his story is, is presented. In the museum, we have a picture of essentially an org chart that he created uh, for the production of a film. And it's a circle. It's not hierarchical. Everybody who has something to do with the film is somewhere in the circle. It starts with Walt and the story, because Walt was, Walt was a story guy. And then the direction, and then the ultimate output is, is the film. But it shows everybody, the traffic police, the, the, the animators, the, everybody who's involved in a film is around, around the perimeter. And I try to follow that model, that, that we need to work all together in a, more of a circular format than the box at the top and you know, the, the typical org chart. In terms of the, um, the operating uh, elements of, of the museum, um, what is your budget? How are you funded? Um, do, you, um, do you focus on developing contributed revenue? How, how does that work? Well, yeah, it's an interesting story. We're only seven years old. We just turned seven uh, October 1st. So um, we're in our infancy. The family had originally contemplated that they would fund it. Um, but when they saw what they had, um, they realized that you know, it, was, it was big. Um, and the construction in the Presidio um, was expensive. And so uh, after I got there, it was set up as a family foundation. And we decided to, um, to transition to a 501c3 public charity. So that was just uh, less than two years ago. So that changed everything, um, changed the fundraising strategy. And uh, interestingly, we found that people wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to, to have a stake in the museum. So we had our first gala last year. And uh, we're about to have our second November 1st. And the company has been very generous with us. So we're going to, going to have it at Disneyland Resort down in Anaheim. And uh, Neil Patrick Harris has agreed to host it. And uh, the production team at Disneyland is doing a masterful job creating a very, very exciting evening. So, But that's just our, our second gala to give you a sense of where we are. So let's talk about, his, uh, about Walt Disney's role in some of his early works. If he is not the person who draws the work, what was his contribution to creating the work? Walt well, was a master storyteller. He also had a keen instinct about what the public would like. He knew how to entertain. So he, he actually was a fairly skilled artist when he was young, but he quickly recognized that there were people that could animate uh, more effectively than he could. He partnered with Ub Iwerks for years, and Ub was a genius. He was the an, original hand of Mickey Mouse. But, uh, but Walt was the voice of Mickey Mouse for many, many years. Uh, but really, Walt's role was to oversee the story and, and the production 
of the work. So he shaped it, he, he built up the narrative, um, he brought these artists together who had capabilities that he did not have. He contributed his own voice um, a, as a voice actor. Uh, but, but really, he is the impresario. He's the person who brings this together and then makes sure that it gets exposed to the public. That's right. That's right. In a way that, that uh, entertains, that, that people can relate to and uh, enjoy. Although it wasn't all fun. If anybody's seen Old Yeller or Bambi, right. he also wanted to show the pathos in life. Uh, that, that was uh, something that was important to him also. Why San Francisco? Why is the museum located where it is? It's a good question, and Diane and her family looked at other locations, but Diane and her family settled here. They, they own Silverado Vineyards in Napa, and her family has a home in San Francisco. And she wanted to be very involved with the design, the construction. She was often seen in a hard hat on the site, and, and she, she really wanted, this was her heart, she wanted to be involved. Uh, and I think Walt would have been happy with it. This is such an innovative you know, center of innovation here, San Francisco, the Silicon Valley. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Well, in many respects, uh, a lot of the, the new technologies that are being applied to this same art form, to the art of animation, whether it's in the virtual reality space or in other spaces, they're actually being generated here by the same creativity that drove Walt Disney. That's right, yeah. And ironically, Walt hired somebody from SRI, Stanford Research Institute, to help him find a good location for Disneyland. Buzz Price was instrumental in that. And many of the rides uh, for the original Disneyland were designed up here uh, in Mountain View. So already there was a connection north. Kirsten, thank you so much for, for helping us to understand the work of Walt Disney. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this man's genius to us all. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for having me.